Well, hello everybody. So talk about blinded by the light here. Mirrors pose a lot of technical problems for us antique dealers of YouTube. Now, this is not an antique. It's a pre-industrial piece of period furniture. And if you're new here, welcome to this Twilight Zone where we really discuss the difference between the vast majority of post-industrial antiques out there and these early original pieces that are really works of art. This one dates to around the year 1800 and it is a shovel glass, it swivels, it's an officer's dressing mirror, and it comes from the Chateau de Vailly, which is an old estate north of Paris. I pillaged it personally, and we can even see this piece lurking, lingering in the upstairs, whatever that is, part of the stairwell, with that beautiful tile floor covered in dust. There may even be a dead fly or two there in the window. Anyway, it comes from the exact type of place we would like to find a piece like this. And yes, all period pieces of this variety generally have been in Chateau before, so we like to use that as a selling point, but I hate to break it to you, it's just the historical reality of all of these pieces. Um, what we're really looking for are good pieces, because believe it or not, there's a lot of ugly pieces that were in Chateau. But I like the provenance of this piece because the piece itself, but the provenance also is a testament to the likely authenticity of this piece. There are more elaborate models of psyche, shovel glasses, which are in redder mahogany and which feature a lot of gilded bronze ornamentation, and those elaborate empire models were heavily copied at the end of the 19th and in the early 20th centuries. And so we have an austere model like this, which less readily was copied, and then we also have a provenance and sort of an original state of conservation that this was found in, covered in dust, that is a testament to this truly being an honest-to-goodness piece from the period, not an expert copy. Structurally, there's no sense of going to the time and trouble to fake this because it's just not that valuable. And also, if we know French law and the history of Chateau and how they were sold, when the Chateau de Vailly was last sold in 1917, I believe, or 23, can't remember, it was still customary for the contents of the home to stay in the home for the new owner. And so it's possible that this piece was in the house since it was made. And, you know, none of that's provable here, but I just want to show you how abstractly the situation in which we find a piece and the nature of the piece itself can be analyzed to help us land on a conclusion as to whether our piece is probably a copy, probably original. You know, we can abstractly sort of conclude things based on where the piece comes from and what type of piece it is uh, without getting scientific and analyzing the wood and doing all of that stuff. Anyway, the Chateau de Vailly was the headquarters of General Montgomery and the British Army in World War II. Even though the good general probably didn't have time to look at himself in this mirror, it is sort of charming to think of how no doubt this old thing was sitting up there at the top of that staircase back in the 1940s, and, well, you know, now we have a way of tying this piece into history with a capital H as Montgomery no doubt walked up and down that staircase several times and probably passed this piece. And so at least we know that since, you know, the rest of this piece in terms of who owned it and how many people have looked in it, all of that would be speculation. But the question of how many people have looked in this piece is possible and it is interesting because the glass here is the original pane of glass that's been retained. And we see that right away, A, because this piece weighs 100 pounds and new glass is just not that heavy, but B, we see the humidity damage on the original mercury glaze here where some dampness has seeped in and caused separation between the amalgam of mercury and lead and the glass, causing there to be little blotches where the mirror is no longer reflective. Then we also see little bubbles in the glass which are true to early 19th century manufacturing techniques. Certainly don't see that on modern mirrors. And there's also a bit of a general haze to this piece, sort of a lack of crispness to your image that, you know, is just true to mirrors from the pre-industrial world. And even though the piece itself is kind of austere, it was really quite a big deal around the year 1800 to have a piece of glass which is single and contiguous like this. We're going to see many mirrors from this period and certainly in the 50 years earlier that are divided because they simply lacked the technology to make contiguous pieces of glass that were this large. So that was quite the statement, even though we see this sort of masculine, austere, neoclassical, early empire, what, simplicity to the piece, 
you know, it was quite a statement to have a piece of glass this big, and I frankly wouldn't have even bothered with this piece. I wouldn't have spent a day of my life going to track it down if it did not retain the original glass. And now, one of the next things we can do in terms of period originality as we examine this piece, as we vet it at a glance, even though the provenance of the piece sort of renders redundant the vetting because it's just logically truly from the period, but we can remove one of these decorative bronze urns here slowly and carefully. And we notice that the screw threads here are typically early 19th century screw threads, which are irregular, which are large and very deep, and which were clearly sculpted out by hand. We also see some of the traces left from how this little urn was cast. We see this, this sort of abrasive surface underneath the parts that have been polished, abrasive surface left from how this was re removed from a sand mold. And so why would they go to the trouble to polish off the sand pitting underneath here when, of course, you're only going to see the outside of the urn. Anyway, we check that the hidden metal work is on par with what we need to see on a period piece from this time. That's good. And then we see the holes here on the side, which, in line with the metal work we just discussed, are actually the traces of the bracketed candelabra that were fixed here that probably would have swung around, and that would have helped you illuminate yourself in the pre-electrical world. It's unfortunate that they're not there. I've only seen two or three which retain their, their candelabra. And then, as we notice that the shovel glass shovels, I suppose, or the swivels, whatever, we see that the little hinges inside the piece, which are not only sturdy enough to support this massive piece of glass that probably weighs 50 pounds, but we see that the brackets that fasten this hinge into the side post, the brackets are actually in the shape of a losange of a type of diamond or quadrilateral shape, which is a common motif of the period. And I find that to really be revelatory of this piece being from the period when we see hidden decorative qualities such as a bracket, a functional bracket that we're never going to see was actually cut out in the shape of a motif that's true to the period. You know, that's really a testament to this pre-industrial depth of quality mindset which really just doesn't translate much into the commercial products that we see around today. And so as we swivel the glass around, we notice all of this dust everywhere. And we also notice that the furniture maker scribbled up here with some sort of a little metal rod. He etched into the wood uh, ba, which is the bottom. So perhaps this was dismantled and they put it up the wrong way. Who knows? But this is apparently the bottom of the mirror, although it's now the top. And when we look at the back of the mirror, we see that it retains what I believe is its original fabric peppered with some reassuring insect holes. And now this might not be original, doesn't matter, but the fabric would have been here originally. And the reason behind that is simply so that you can have this piece out in the middle of the room somewhere, so that if you ever walk behind it, you wouldn't be confronted with the unsightly back of a mercury glazed mirror. The fabric is much more uniform and you know, nice to look at in a room than sort of the gross blotchy lead mercury amalgamation that's on the back of this glass. And then we have the typical blackened claw feet of early empire pieces, which retain their original casters. That's kind of a plus, but very quickly with these pieces, we learn not to roll them around. They're just better off picked up and displaced very carefully. Let's not uh, put too much mileage on those wheels anymore. So with all of that being said, everybody, I hope that you've enjoyed taking a closer look at this wonderful trace of the early empire period, this trace of an old chateau, the Chateau de Vailly, Montgomery's brief headquarters during the Normandy invasion. And as usual, if you'd like to support this endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter, please subscribe to the channel. It would be most appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>